Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first uh, installment of our very exciting um, lecture series for the fall. Um, this is the Connecticut River Museum's um, River Series, and the first of four lectures begins this evening with Jennifer Drana from the National Mississippi River Museum and Aquarium. Um, the series was developed with a nod toward our second floor exhibit, which is the river that connects us. And thinking outside the box, we decided to think of how the rivers across the country connect us all. Um, Jennifer Drana is our speaker tonight. Um, she is the curator of education at the National Mississippi River Museum and Aquarium. Uh, she grew up in Wisconsin and has always enjoyed being in nature, especially near the water. She's been an environmental educator for more than 12 years and began working at the National Mississippi River Museum and Aquarium in 2017. Some of Jennifer's favorite programs to teach involve live animal ambassadors because they provide an up close memorable connection between the subject matter and the program participants. In her spare time, she also loves traveling, coaches a local swim team, and volunteers with several regional raptor conservation groups. Um, so I wanna welcome Jennifer. I wanna encourage everyone. Um, she's comfortable with questions asked along the way. If you'd like to ask, if you're more comfortable waiting until the end, we'll have a session at the end as well. Um, and there is of course the chat box at the bottom of the screen that um, will allow you to put questions in if you if you'd rather do it that way. Um, just so you know, um, October twelfth, we'll be welcoming the Columbia River Maritime Museum. On November sixteenth, the Ohio River Museum, and on December seventh, um, our own museum, the Connecticut River Museum. So, without further ado, I welcome and thank Jennifer for joining us tonight. So, Jennifer Drana. Perfect. Well, thank you. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have actually heard of our museum before. Um, the National Mississippi River Museum and Aquarium is in the city of Dubuque, Iowa. So I actually have a little like introduction slide um, so that you can see. Um, so if you think about kind of the Midwest and you have Wisconsin, Illinois, and Iowa all touching, um, you can actually see all three states from my office. So we are right at that cross section um, near Lock and Dam. We're near um, Lock and Dam 11. So we um, are really kind of central. Um, and we're, of course, part of that huge agricultural part of the country. Um, so we have a lot of influence on the water quality of the Mississippi. So we are one of 15 facilities to be both accredited by the American Alliance of Museums as well as the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. So we are a very interesting cross section in that we have over 2000 animals of about 214 species when we last ran our count. So we have a lot of different aquariums. We have birds, we have snakes, we have otters, all sorts of different critters. In addition to over 41,000 historical um, items in our collection. So we are truly both an aquarium and a museum. Um, and our mission is to inspire stewardship by creating educational experiences where history and rivers come alive. So tonight we're going to be talking a lot about kind of the Mississippi watershed and some of the early industries and how we use that river. Um, I am going to highlight a couple of the animals that have been critical in the area that I am from um, in terms of kind of settling and um, really early industry. So with that, we're gonna start by talking watershed so that we know the area that we're discussing. So the Mississippi watershed is a massive area. And I'm hoping that most of you on this call are familiar with the term watershed. Uh, when I'm talking to kids, like elementary school kids, I often have them picture a kitchen sink. So when you turn on the spigot and water comes out of your faucet, anywhere in that sink that water hits, it's gonna work its way down the side of the sink, down the bottom to the drain, so it's going to work its way down the piping and then out to the local system. That's kind of what a watershed is. So anywhere on the map that is green, that a water droplet hits, eventually it's going to make its way through the water table, the streams, 
the lakes, the rivers to the Mississippi River. So we are really talking from the Appalachian Mountains to the Rocky Mountains. It covers um, 31 states and two Canadian provinces. And the river itself is about 2,300 miles. So it's a rather large space. So of course, I'm just touching the surface of some of the stuff related to this area. So with that, we're gonna kind of go back to culture and how it started. Um, early explorers, um, this is an example of a voyageur canoe. And so typically as the French were the primary explorers in this region, um, were working their way westward. You would see these big canoes, uh, they would sing, they would uh, fur trap, they would do a lot of trade um, with the native um, or local people. Um, and this was really one of the early industries was the fur trade. So in our area, there was a number of fur posts set up and that is where you could bring um, your furs and trade for items. So that's one of the first big pushes. And then the second big expedition is of course the Lewis and Clark. And so as part of this, they did spend a fair amount of time in the Iowa area and along the Mississippi River. Of course, they were famously looking for that river that ran east to west across North America. That doesn't exist. Um, but they are looking for an easy way to connect the European um, and Asian trade centers. And unfortunately, they didn't find it. But along the way, they found a lot of fantastic natural resources. And that, again, just set up a lot of early Iowa. So here we have commerce. So looking at this as an example of when you would go to one of those trade posts or fur posts, um, what you might see. So there's a nice stretched out beaver pelt there. And that is essentially what they used for money. So you would go out trapping, you would collect all your beaver fur and um, paddle up to the fur trade, carry your um, furs in, and everything would be priced by beaver fur. You could bring your skunk pelts, you could bring muskrat and rabbit, any other fur bearing mammal you could bring to the um, post and use for trade, but everything was put in the price of beaver fur. So it might take you three skunk fur to equal the same amount of money as a beaver fur. So looking at the photo that you see, there's a whole bunch of different objects. Um, up front kind of in the middle is a fire making kit. So that would be like flint and steel. Um, that might cost you half a beaver fur. Um, there is a spotting scope um, kind of on the left side of the picture. Um, that might be two beaver fur. Um, some of the more intricate beads and whatnot might be half a beaver fur to a beaver fur. And I don't know um, if how like good all your screens are, or if you can zoom in at all, but on the right side, on the green blankets itself, they actually um, would mark um, how much the blanket would cost. And each dash that you see underneath um, the pocket knife there would represent one beaver fur. So that wool blanket that all of those objects are sitting on would cost you three beaver fur. Um, so again, this is all objects that would make your life easier when you were living on the river. Um, you could buy steel traps and some other things to help you hunt as well. So here's the North American beaver. Uh, voyagers and early explorers were fantastic at using every piece of the animal. Uh, so they would trap and the fur would, um, they would use either for clothing or they would take to the trading post, but they would also um, eat much of the animal that they caught. And a lot of the research that I've done actually says that one of the best pieces of beaver um, was the beaver tail prepared as a beaver tail stew. And so they would actually eat the tail as well, almost like a jerky um, today. So again, wasting nothing, making sure they are um, using their resources. Now, part of the reason that everyone was, that the early explorers were so excited to find natural resources like the beaver was because they nearly trapped the European beaver a very similar looking animal native to Europe to extinction. Um, does anyone know why the beaver was so critically important? Like what's its story? Why were we so focused on that one mammal? Any idea? I have a bunch of props, so don't worry. The top hat. <laughs> 
This is what was all the rage. It was how you showed your status in society was a felt top hat. Now, if you have ever had the privilege of touching a beaver fur, they're really interesting. So the top layer is very, very rough, almost like you're petting a domestic dog. That uh, particular layer um, is the guard hair. So it just helps kind of trap air um, with the animal to keep them warm. If you were to peel that back though, there is the softest fur you have ever felt underneath. Um, and that uh, is what they would use to turn um, the fur into pelt. So they would take all, or take these, take the fur into a hat, felt, not a pelt. So the um, trapping center or station would take all of these furs and ship them back to Europe, um, to the major population centers. And then hat makers would take this pelt and process it. Now, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Alice in Wonderland and a certain character, right? The Mad Hatter. So the way that they did that is they would take a handful of liquid mercury, put it on the um, pelt and rub it around. That liquid mercury would actually remove the guard hair, that top rough layer of fur. And then underneath, you would just have that super soft layer of fur left. Now, obviously today, we know that mercury is not something you should be handling, you shouldn't be messing around with. So Mad Hatter is based in truth because a lot of hat makers would actually go insane over time from their industry. But instead of, you know, today we have the latest iPhones or the latest Nikes or whatever. Instead of that, this is how they showed their status and different shaped top hats. Um, would be if you were in the military, if you were royalty, if you were a commoner, um, it was one way to show that off. So that is why they are so important. Now, we too were really hard on beaver populations and across much of the country, beaver populations plummeted after European explorers arrived. And while we didn't extirpate them the same way a lot of European countries had, our population really, really dwindled to the point that um, in the last 100 years or so, we've had to get really creative to reintroduce them to areas. That includes actually dropping them out of airplanes and boxes um, to get them to remote areas. The reason that this is so important is that beavers are a keystone species. Their dams and their lodges that they build are actually critical for a lot of the less um, charismatic animals um, to survive. So if you think about the, um, sorry, the dam structure, that backs up water and raises the water level behind it. The lodge is where the beavers actually live, but both those structures have a lot of hidey holes. So all the little fish, all the frogs and the snakes and the smaller birds, everybody can raise their family in there. It provides protection from predators. It provides a lot of places for insects to lay their eggs and provides food sources. So what we noticed when the beaver disappeared from a lot of our waterways is our ecosystems as a whole were just not as healthy. Now, the North American beaver, of course, has a very wide range. You're going to find them across much of the northern um, northeastern part of the United States and into Canada. Um, and they're a story that a lot of people are familiar with in terms of the animals of the Mississippi River. The next one is one that most of us are not as familiar with. And it is these. So this, believe it or not, is one of the other major industries along the river here in Iowa, freshwater mussels. So do any of you like, are you familiar with these at all? Anyone? Like you go out locally and find them maybe? No? Okay, so we here at the Mississippi River Museum and Aquarium, super passionate about mussels. Um, so freshwater mussels at one point in history, so um, thinking back to like the late 1800s, you could walk out into the Mississippi River and instead of stepping on rocks, you would be stepping on mussels. That's how many of them there were. Everywhere you stepped. Oh, perfect. Yeah, so Carol just said out west, a lot of swans depended on beavers. Yes, a lot of waterfowl do, which is fascinating and not something we necessarily pair together. So that's a good point. Okay, so I have a mussel shell here. 
kind of looks just like a rock, nothing too big, nothing too exciting. And what they do is they bury themselves about halfway in the sediment of the river. And then the mussel, because this is an animal, will open up just ever so slightly and its shell will be open. And its siphon will actually pull water in and that's how they feed. So everywhere you'd step, you'd be stepping on one of these. North America has the greatest variety of freshwater mussels anywhere in the world. So we have over 300 species on this continent, which is just incredible. And they have super fun names. So you're gonna have a pistol grip, you're gonna have a heel splitter, pig's toe, warty back. Um, the different regions named them, of course, based on the shape and bumps and characteristics of their shells. So there's this gentleman in the late 1800s named John Bethel. And he was sitting um, in a town about um, 30 minutes drive south of me. And he saw this and he's like, you know what? I bet you I could turn those muscles into something. And so he started one of the early or one of the industries in the late 1800s that was a real big boom for the Dubuque area. And you can see um, kind of on the one picture how dense they can be. Um, but do any of you know what he managed to turn this into? And does perfect buttons. John Beppel started the button industry. So if you trap these muscles and you break them open, they have these beautiful pearly color on the inside. And that is what he actually used to create the original buttons for clothing. Now, in order to do this, he had to get creative because if you're going to have a major industry, you have to be able to produce a lot of the item. So he came up with a whole bunch of tools that were unique to the freshwater muscle button industry, including the one on the picture that you see there. So these animals, in order to capture them, if you just cast a hook out like you do for fishing, you might catch one here or there, but it's not an efficient way to do it. So he took advantage of their natural history. He knowing that they would sit underneath the sediment with that shell partly open, he created a long rod with dozens of fishing hooks on it. He would push it over the boat and drag it along the bottom of the river. And anytime one of those hooks touched where the shell was open, the freshwater mussel would clamp shut onto the hook. And then he'd be able to pull that all up. And you can see he would catch dozens of freshwater mussels that way. So he um, patented that hook, that fishing system. In addition, so here's what a mussel shell looks like with all the buttons punched out. Um, and we can still find these um, as you're walking along the Mississippi River here in Iowa, is these mussel shells with the holes in them from the button industry. So you can see that he had to develop a tool to perfectly punch out all of those holes without shattering the shell itself. Um, and again, they have this like beautiful pearly color. So original buttons were all that white color. And this was in the late 1800s. Um, at the peak from this small town in Iowa, he was exporting more than 1 billion buttons a year. They were going all the way over to Asia. He was shipping worldwide. He had a major boom. So you can imagine if you're this small town in Iowa, you're harvesting all of these freshwater mussels to support this industry, very quickly, Mr. Beppel noticed that it was not as easy to catch freshwater mussels anymore. He had overexploited the resource. And so in less than 10 years, he had built this industry up and then his resource crashed and so did his industry. Interestingly, right along, around the same time as plastic buttons started to become available. Now, he acknowledged his role in the freshwater mussel population decline. And towards the end of his life, he actually was working um, with scientists to figure out a way to help the freshwater mussel population rebound. Locally, our freshwater mussel population still has not recovered. And that's 120, almost 130 years ago now. So I'll talk more about this at the end of the program and what we're doing. Um, but this particular industry, um, really kind of from Southern Minnesota to just South of Dubuque, 
is where the bulk of the industry ended up taking place. And unfortunately, we still are working with our muscle populations. Like our beaver though, there's a reason that we are so passionate about it. And that is because they are also what's called an indicator species. So remember how I told you they fed? They just had part of their shell and pulled water in? Well, it turns out that all of these muscles, they remove all the little phytoplanktons, all the sediments, all the little things that make the water really dirty and gross to us as humans. Um, so when freshwater mussel populations declined, we noticed that a lot of other river species also disappeared locally because the water quality wasn't right. There was um, visibility wasn't good enough for some animals to catch food. Others, there was too, um, there's the wrong nutrient levels um, in it for them to survive. You would have a lot of algae blooms because of that. So by reintroducing this little animal that looks like a rock, we're actually helping a lot of the water quality parameters so that the river is more useful to us as humans, as well as a lot of our native wildlife. So this is one of those indicator species, like a lot of inverts um, in the area. Any questions on mussels? Because I know it's not something that as many people are familiar with. How many mussels are um, needed to purify the water? So we've done some really interesting videos with um, mussels in an aquarium with PBS Iowa. So if you go on YouTube and search us with PBS Iowa, um, I can try and pull up the link here towards the end of the program. Um, we actually put some water in, I think it's like a 20 gallon aquarium, one without a mussel, one with a mussel. And I think it's in less than like 10 minutes or so and it's just regular Mississippi River water. The one with the muscle, there's a clarity difference enough that the camera can pick it up. And we let it cycle a little bit more and it goes completely clear with the muscle and then regular water remains in the one without. So I forget how fast they siphon, but it is a lot because they're just constantly siphoning water through and then spitting it out the back end, whatever they don't need. Are there zebra mussels in the area? Yes, and a lot of them. And like most places, we hate them. Um, zebra mussels are an invasive species. So they are great where they are supposed to be. In their native habitat, they have a very important role. Um, they are part of the ecosystem. They are great. When they were introduced to the United States through ballast water or shipping, um, there's no checks or balances on their population. So they're able to reproduce really, really fast. And that's where the problem comes in because nothing eats them locally, um, except a few carp, but they're not able to eat fast enough to put a true dent in the population. So zebra mussels, they will just attack on, I don't have a mussel shell with me that has them. They'll basically just cover the native mussels to the point that the, our native mussels cannot open their shells to feed. Um, so they're basically starving out our native populations. Also, there's so much competition for food from the mussels that the zebra mussels outcompete our native species as well. So unfortunately, yes, we, and I have pictures of this at the end, but we are very active in freshwater mussel um, propagation, um, growth, reintroduction. We work a ton with our Fish and Wildlife Service, Iowa DNR, Wisconsin DNR, Illinois DNR, to be part of the project in our area. And we have freshwater mussels, endangered species, um, growing up in our harbor right now. And in about a month, Fish and Wildlife will come pick them up and put them in areas where the species once was, but is no longer. And so we're part of that reintroduction process. Now, as part of that, because we have zebra mussels, every single week, we have to go out to the buckets that are holding those endangered species, pull the bucket out of the water, and take each individual mussel and clear off all of the zebra mussels from it so that those endangered species can survive. So we're very intentional on making sure that 
we're giving the endangered piece. Yeah. Oh, very good. Yes. Like the oysters in Chesapeake Bay. I actually did spend part of my career out in the Chesapeake Bay too. So I was out east very, very briefly. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of intense reintroduction efforts right now in part because of the zebra mussel. What do they do with the mussels when they took the shell? So freshwater mussels on the whole, um, people don't eat the same way they eat oysters or some of the coastal um, animals that look similar. So I've, I've never tried one, but I've heard that it just tastes like eating sand. So not typically something that is edible. Um, they might have used it to feed some livestock or some um, farm animals, but a lot of times the mussel scraps, like the shells that they weren't using, they would actually just pitch back into the river, which is why we're still finding them washing up today, um, which is actually useful in itself because this is a great place to kind of, or a great item to help stabilize some of the sediments when you get a ton of these in an area. So not, I don't think they ate them. Oh, in Connecticut, they punch buttons out of beef bone. Interesting, I didn't know that. Interesting. Any other questions? Okay, so my guess is some of my next slides might be familiar um, to you if you spent a lot of time kind of along the rivers and kind of looking at how people transported items. So obviously I said we had some industry and what people don't always put together is that as industry expanded, as our population centers expanded from east to west, we had to figure out better ways to move goods and people. So early explorers, they used a canoe, right? You didn't have to move fast, you're exploring, canoes were easy, um, put a couple people in them, you can maneuver them, and you can take your personal goods with you. So they're pretty good, but you can't carry much with you. So as we started to get things like fur trade and lumber and um, buttons, we would continually uh, modify our boats. So on the Mississippi, after canoes, the next major boat innovation was flat boats. So you can see they're still human powered, right? So you have these big paddles, but they're a lot wider and longer than a canoe. So you're able to move more things and more people. Um, but very hard to go up river. So these were great when you were going down river with the current, but to get things back north was still very challenging. So the next innovation came with how we powered the boats. So up next, oh, there we go. Steamboats was the next big thing. So we are burning lumber or coal to produce hot air, to turn the big paddles. So this is how they started moving people between major population centers, um, as the, particularly along the Mississippi as things expanded. Now, interestingly, um, the Sprague was built north of us in La Crosse, Wisconsin, and it would regularly do trips between Dubuque and La Crosse. Um, so that is a very famous boat in this part of the country. And then there's this color picture of a steamboat because today we have a major tourism industry here on the Mississippi River where people will rent almost like a cruise boat. They'll rent a room for a week or whatnot and do major travels from New Orleans to St. Louis up to Minneapolis, um, St. Paul, Minnesota. So we see a ton of these um, replica steamboats today uh, moving along the river as part of the tourism industry. So still moving lots of people just for a little bit different purpose. And then um, we have this. So this is what we see even more than those tourist boats today. This is a tow barge. Um, so the Mississippi River is a major wa um, waterway for moving goods. Even still today, a lot of goods are moved along the Mississippi River. And the Mississippi River has a series of 26 locks and dams from St. Louis north to St. Paul, Minnesota. So we are right in the series of lock and dams here in Dubuque. Um, and this is the time of year that we see all these boats. And so you'll notice a couple pieces. Pushing it is um, the tow. And then you will have a series of up to five barges. So it's three across and up to five long. 
Um, from my research, these can be about a quarter mile long by the time you stack all of that together. So it is a lot of space. They're slow moving. We're talking like maximum eight miles an hour. Um, but it is a great way to move goods. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Do you have lock and dams out there or have you been to the Mississippi to see these? Yeah, so basically a lock is the piece that actually moves the boat. Um, so the lock kind of is like a water elevator for these big vessels. So the Mississippi River changes in um, depth as you go up and down. And so what these big boats will do is they will um, go into a lock and then the doors will shut. And then the Corps of Engineers is able to control the water level between the two sets of doors so that they can move the boat upriver or downriver depending on um, the situation. So people on the coast, I usually tell them it's kind of like a salmon ladder and where you kind of have those jumps um, to work your way up or down um, stream. But for in this case, a giant boat. And like I said, there are a lot of them. They're run by the Corps of Engineers. Um, and they, um, in a lot of cases, are actually um, in need of a lot of repairs because they're getting pretty antiquated and starting to show um, their age. So I have a picture next of what one of these actually looks like. So you can see that um, the doors are open on the one side. Um, so the boat has gone in. And then if you look just past in the middle of all of where the cargo would be, you'll see that there is actually a line. If you have a fully loaded tow barge, it doesn't all fit in the lock at once. They actually have to break it off into two sections. So they'll put half the cargo through, tie it off, and then the tow will come back to get the second half of cargo and push it through. So depending on how busy the lock is, it can actually take over an hour for this entire vessel to get through that system. I had the privilege of living north in Wisconsin um, at a when I worked for a different facility at Lock and Dam 4. My apartment actually overlooked the Lock and Dam so I could sit out on my deck and watch this whole process. And it was very interesting. I've also been out in a canoe and have had to go through a lock. So these are not just for your commerce vessels. This is also how recreational vehicles will move up and, up and down river when they are on the water. So I've gone through a lock in a little canoe with some big like pleasure boats um, next to me and it is terrifying. You're holding onto a rope so your canoe stays in the right spot. Um, and yeah, you, I felt like an ant because this picture doesn't do it justice for how big this actually is. The tow is basically a floating city. So that is where all the staff stay. There's kitchen, there's beds, um, there's um, the captain's quarters, of course, there's the pilot house, there's all sorts of moving pieces so that the staff can be on this boat for 30 days at a time. So you're going to have two crews, a night crew and a day crew, you're going to have a lot of people living on the vessel, so you have to be able to support that and that's all in that um, tow part. So I have a question about how deep the river is in that area, which is great because that brings up another issue. So for these boats to move, the river has to be at least nine feet deep. Any shallower and the boats won't float, they'll hit ground. Um, if you get to flood stage of the river, the currents get dangerous. So there is a lot of active management of the Mississippi River in large part because of the barge industry. So they have dredging vessels that go out on the river and basically they're giant sand vacuum cleaners is what I say. So they'll kind of monitor the flow of the river and the depth of the river and they'll bring this um, dredging boat in and you'll see them sucking up sand from one spot and it's shooting out the other end to shore to create that channel depth that these boats need. Um, so this right now, the Mississippi River where we are is at a perfect depth. We have boats moving all the time. But when we have those high flood years, it actually suspends transportation on the river because it's too dangerous for these large, large boats to be out there. They start to crash into shore. Um, we've actually um, 
in 2018 had one crash into the lock and dam here in Dubuque and it spilled its entire load of cargo into the river. So you really have to manage um, that. The captains, um, just so you have an idea of how much schooling it is, the captains go through more schooling than airplane pilots in order to be able to navigate these vessels on the river. So a lot of education, a lot of working your way up in order to successfully and safely steer these with, of course, all of the recreational boats and um, whatnot that are sharing the river channel with you. So yeah, kind of river pilots, more or less, that the captains of these boats. Now, you're probably wondering what on earth we are putting in these barges. So these are the main commodities that you'll see. Um, a lot of grains, a lot of sand, oil, petroleum, um, metals. They also move a lot of trash um, by barge because while it is slow, it is a very efficient way to move goods. So I have a little quiz question. There's two of them I think hidden in this presentation. Do any of you know what the main good moved by barge is today? So your choices are petroleum, corn, wheat, and aluminum. So somebody gets wheat, somebody's got corn. Any other guesses? Wheat? Aluminum? It's actually petroleum. We move a ton of petroleum on the Mississippi River. So I'm gonna skip that slide. Okay, so you probably are already kind of thinking this through in your head, particularly since you hopped onto a series about rivers. Um, but here's a map of major rivers and cities. So they definitely connect. And with kids, I'd like to point out that barge is an amazing way to ship things because it is cheap um, and you're able to get to a lot of places. But of course, not every city is on a river. So you have to think outside the box to get it beyond that. So approximately 800 million tons of cargo is transported by barge each year. One barge holds the same amount of cargo as 16 train cars or 70 semi trucks. So you can imagine why it is fantastic that we use the river as kind of a highway. It gets a lot of that wear and tear, congestion, other things off our roadways. It comes with its own cons as well. I already mentioned how we have to truly manage the river for these vessels. And that comes with its own set of consequences um, for our wildlife, but it is cheaper. So a lot of um, people choose barge when there's not a tough deadline for getting an item to a buyer. Um, now, the flip side is trucks are a lot more efficient. So if you have a buyer that needs your good by a certain time and you only have like four days, go with the semi truck. Train cars kind of fall in, in the um, middle there. It's also uh, more energy efficient if you start to look at how much energy it takes to move the product. Barge ends up being a little bit more energy efficient as well. Okay, so we're gonna round it out. We have five more minutes here with a little bit about river careers because I already mentioned the in barge industry is huge. And a lot of people think that it's just, you throw some stuff on a boat, that's it. Those are your river careers. Especially um, locally, people for whatever reason are a little bit more disconnected by how many careers are now somehow associated with the river. So without, in the boat, you have your crew guys that are responsible for helping things go through the locks and dams, getting the goods on and off the boat. Um, I mentioned already that typically they're gonna spend a month on boat away from their families living on the boat before they'll take a month off. The shipping season, if you're on a barge, it's pretty short. Where I am, the Mississippi River freezes in the winter, so you can't move goods year round. Um, you have your captain as well, so he's gonna be one of the highest paid staff that's actually steering the boat, driving the boat. But you have a lot of support systems for these guys. You have all the admin staff that are making sure that all the receipts are taken care of, all the goods, get to the right port, the whole plan there. You have welders, you have electricians, all the moving pieces um, are connected to these boats. So particularly when I'm talking with high schoolers, I remind them that you don't always have to go to college. There are a lot of fantastic trades in the area for really well-paying jobs. If they're somebody that learns better um, using their hands and in action than from a textbook. 
Um, here is an example of something that is a little bit more of a traditional career. Um, we have a lot of biologists that, of course, work on the river. And this is actually our freshwater mussel propagation project. Um, we have, like I said, in our port or our harbor, we have a long dock where we are raising endangered species. In the back is actually a barge, or not a barge, a dredge boat that is on the historic registry that um, did a lot of dredging early on. But basically, we work with Fish and Wildlife Service. We raise these mussels. Their biologists come in. They help us do water quality. Um, we actually have started an amazing program with high school students that we invite their um, high school environmental science classes, chemistry classes, biology classes down. And what we have the students do is we give them each a bucket of freshwater mussels, and they have to measure them all so we can determine growth rates and health of the individuals. And they have to help us remove all of those um, zebra mussels from each bucket. So it's a great way for us to connect these students to an actual endangered species. And on the photo there, you can, on the right-hand photo where it's just the fingers with the muscle, you can see the one muscle with three zebra muscles um, attached to it. When the zebra muscles are reintroduced to open water, Oh, when the muscles are reintroduced, do the zebra muscles overwhelm them? In some cases, yes. Um, we are trying to figure out ways to reduce um, zebra mussel populations. Very little heart, like great success so far. But we're hoping that by time we release them, they are big enough that they can survive long enough to do some good to reproduce to help that wild population rebound. We know that um, not 100% will survive, um, but we are hopeful. Um, yeah, when the students take the zebra mussels off, this is going to sound awful, but we basically just leave them on the deck of that dock to bake so that we, we don't put those zebra mussels that are alive back in the river. We let them kind of bake on the top so that we're at least doing a little part to help that problem, but it's very, very minimal. But we have actually lost entire buckets um, because if we're like, if we can't get to a bucket one week and we maybe have to go two weeks, in some cases they actually clog the bucket to the point that there's not water going in and out of the bucket. And then the zebra mussels um, end up killing our endangered species. So we have a lot of staff time dedicated to this, a lot of grants, a lot of interns. Um, but it's a very interesting project and one that a lot of other um, association of zoos and aquariums, other facilities like us are starting to get on board and they're asking us how to do it because it is such a critical part to a healthy waterway. And like I said, North America has the greatest diversity of freshwater mussels anywhere in the world. And then of course, here's a few more scientists. It's not all about mussels. You have your people that go out there and catch fish and help us determine you know, the, how many fish you get to take home, your um, daily limits. Um, they just help us determine that. You have the water quality technicians that tell us if it's safe to go into a river or not, or if we can eat the fish that we catch from a certain waterway. And so there's a lot of um, science careers associated with the river, of course. And then there's people like me who like to do a little bit of everything. And I am lucky enough that I get to teach people about how awesome our waterways are. So I think I timed it pretty good. Excellent. Um, so any questions? These are two of our North American river otters um, that used to reside here at the River Museum. So rivers, river otters were, of course, another very charismatic animal that is commonly found in this part of the country. So any questions? What do you got? What do you got for me? What do you want to know? Is there an ultimate way to, I, is there a great way to eradicate zebra mussels? I wish. It costs us millions and millions and millions of dollars each year across the country, just trying to make sure that they don't like plug all the piping and whatnot that we need. Uh, it is so challenging. But right now, no, there's not a great way to do it. There's a lot of smart people working on it though, um, but nothing at a wide scale. Like I said, there's a few carp that eat them, but not enough to put a major dent in the population. Where do we get a lot of the animals? Um, in our care. So as a member of AZA, many of our animals are actually um, either bred in captivity or come to us from other zoos and aquariums. So if there's a new um, animal that I'm looking for to teach with, 
I will put a little message up almost on a message board and say, hey, I'm looking for this type of turtle. Does every, anyone have one that they are maybe looking for placement? And we'll switch animals between facilities so that everyone is getting their needs met. In some cases, um, like our native raptors, we have a um, bald eagle that lives here on display. Um, I have an American kestrel that I travel with. Both those birds were actually injured when they were very young and are not able to survive on their own in the wild. So because they're native raptors, there's different um, legislation around how we can acquire them. Um, and in some cases, it is wildlife trafficking. They get caught by federal um, officials. And after the court cases are done, they will put those animals in care of zoos and aquariums that are accredited when they cannot go back to the wild. So we play a role there as well. So it kind of depends on what the exact animal is, but we have a number of ways. Um, how long is the Mississippi River? Approximately 2,300 miles. Um, there's a little bit of variance there. Some people say 2,318, some say 2,341, um, but I just kind of say about 2,300. Oh, thanks, Tom, I'm glad you liked it. What is the greatest challenge for the future of the Mississippi River? That is a great question. Um, water quality for us is huge. Being in the agricultural like center of the country, we know that what we do here in Iowa ends up downstream. So everything that Minnesota and Iowa does eventually is going to work its way down to places um, like New Orleans. And we are part of the problem when it comes to the dead zone. So figuring out ways that we can balance the human needs with the wildlife needs um, and everyone can be happy, I think is going to be one of the biggest challenges. And here in Iowa, um, what we're finding is that farmers, they really like the way they've done things for many, many years. But when you start to go to them and have them look at solutions that are great, maybe save them a little bit money um, or don't cost any different, but have a huge impact on the environment, they will make the change. But you have to go have those conversations on the small scale. And we have some um, an amazing gentleman that um, heads up our conservation department that is having those conversations to try and move the needle on some of our water quality issues so that we can reach beyond just the state of Iowa. But yeah, water quality is huge. And that's not just for Iowa. It's really for the whole um, system. Do we offer outreach? Yes. So we do distance learning and we travel anywhere within about a two hour radius of Dubuque. I travel with over 50 different animals and then we also have historic programming as well. Um, but I travel with things like tarantulas, snakes, turtles, birds, sharks. Um, you know, we are the National Mississippi River Museum and Aquarium. So we go from headwaters to gulf. So we actually travel with sharks and stingrays as well, which is pretty fun. Any other questions? Oh, y'all are so kind, thank you. I appreciate it. No other questions from anyone? Okay. Well, Jennifer, I wanna thank you so very much for, oh, Oh, so where is the zebra mussel from? From hmm. Europe. And so it was actually brought over in the ballast water of ships crossing the ocean. So it was introduced out um, east and then it slowly worked its way um, westward because our waters are all connected. What about the Asian carp? Yeah, the Asian carp. Um, people eat it, people fish it. Um, but again, the, one of the interesting problems with that is that it can hybridize with some of our native species. So we're getting some interesting things happening there. Um, at a different facility that I worked with, we are actually um, a part of a study to try and figure out how far the Asian carp had spread by looking at bird poop. They were looking at um, taking the mutes from the raptors that we had, and they were looking at what um, eDNA was in the raptor poop, and they were able to tell if Asian carp were in the area or not. So our captive birds were the control study. Uh, so we gathered um, 
information from them. We um, sent the scientists their poop before, and then we fed them some Asian carp and we sent them the poop afterwards. Um, and they were able to kind of figure that out. So there's a lot of interesting work like that being done in facilities like ours to help those big questions of how do we manage or reduce some of those invasive species as well in ways that you wouldn't expect necessarily. Even just looking at poop is part of the solution to, um, that we're working towards, so. Any other questions? I don't wanna cut anyone off. Okay. Well, I want to personally thank you so much, Jennifer. I'm so happy that you were able to join us, and I'm so glad that you were um, the, the first speaker in the series. And I want to thank everyone for um, attending tonight, and I encourage you to um, join us next month with the Columbia River Maritime Museum. Um, but again, I want to thank Jennifer for um, for hanging in there with me through the whole process and everything. And I am so glad you were able to, um, to join us and to be part of this. I'm going to be sharing the recording um, with a lot of people that were unable to attend tonight. There's, um, you know, just the, just the time change across the country yeah. um, makes it a little bit challenging for the, for um, people who are interested on the West Coast. So my hope is to get all four of them up there and I um, will certainly send you the links for the other three speakers so that you can share it with your with your people as well but thank you so much and thank you Jennifer Carlson as well for always being so supportive so thanks very much good night thank you everyone and Jennifer thank you again you are so wonderful I really love it thank you so much <laughs> well have a great evening bye everyone you too thanks Jennifer bye <laughs>